Okey diyoruz. En son ne oldu? Bunun önceki bölüm zaman geçti cümlesiyle başladı. Ve böyle bir cümle bir kitapta kullanılıyorsa çok yüksek ihtimal büyük bir olayın zamanın geldiğine işaret olmuş oluyor. Bence çünkü hani zaman geçiyor. O zaman boyunca çok da önemli şeyler olmadı. Ama şimdi bir yerde durduk ve o durduğumuz yer orada durduk. Çünkü orada büyük bir olay var ondan ötürü durduk falan. Ben bu açıdan geçen bölüm büyük bir şey olmasını bekliyordum. Ekstradan olmadı ama bu bölümün adından anladığım kadarıyla bu bölümde oluyor. Bir yanlışım yoksa ki yok çünkü bölümün adı öyle diyor. Büyük bölüm, baya büyük bir bölüm. Hani kitaptaki en önemli üç bölümden birisi olabilir. Bütün seri boyunca, üçüncü kitabı daha bilmiyoruz ama ilk iki kitap içinde de en önemli bölümlerden biri diyor. Hatta... En önemli ilk üçten biri olma ihtimali ne yüksek. Umarım spoilerımsı bir şey değildi bu verdiklerim falan aşırı önemli ama. Çok çok, çok bekliyordum buraya gelme ve sonunda geldik diyoruz. Böyle aşırı dikkatli bir şekilde okuyacağım, düşüneceğim, taşınacağız öyle. Geçen bölüm ne oldu? Kıvot işte iyice zaman geçirmeye başlamış çat pat fey öğreniyor ama sonra Felir'in çok böyle... Daralıklı bir hoca olduğu için Kıvot pes ediyor fey öğrenme konusunda. Aklıma böyle babaların çocuklarını araba sürmeyi öğretirken çok bağırıp çağırmalarımsı bir şey geldi. O tarz bir muhabbet dönüyor sanki. Onun dışında Kıvot iyice Felirin'le samimileştiği için işte sen nasıl yapıyorsun, nasıl işte şeydi yapıyorsun, gölgeyi tutamazsın ki, ayışını tutamazsın ki nasıl onları tutabiliyorsun falan. Felirin buna dedi ki sen işte mutlu olmak için çok fazla... İşte biliyorsun, çok fazla soruyorsun, çok fazla düşünüyorsun falan. Kıvot öyle deyince böyle aklına Elodin falan geldi ama sonra tekrar vazgeçti öyle düşünmekten. Böyle bir arabında Felirin dedik bana şu ay parçası, ay ışığını uzatır mısın? Kıvot da direkt böyle hani o Felirin'in zaten bir olayı var. O bir, bir şey isteyince emir gibi gidiyor. Ve büyülü olduğu için direkt kendinize onu uygularken buluyorsunuz. Kıvot böyle ay ışığını tuttu biraz kaldırdı sonra fark etti ki elindeki ay ışığı. Sonra birden öyle fark edince tutamamaya başladı falan ama tutabildiydi. Hani üstüne çok düşünmüyorduyken yapabiliyordu ama üstü düşünmeye başladığı an, hesaplamaya başladığı an yapamamaya başladı diyoruz. Aynı hesap ne oldu? Kutuyu açıl dedi, vurdu tabolünde great gibi yapacağım diye kutu açıldı falan. Çünkü açılacağını düşünmüyordu, açılacağını ihtimal vermiyordu diyoruz. Hani hesaplamıyorken en maksimum seviye doğallıkla çıkıyor. Yaptığı şeyler kendisinden best the point sanırım. Bunun dışında Feyler, Feyler'in şarkılarından birkaç tane öğrenmiş ama o kadar enteresan melodileri var ki falan. Hani böyle lütuna çalmaya çalıştığı zaman direkt böyle bir elleri şey oluyor. Ellerini tam istediği gibi kontrol edemiyor. Kendisini şey gibi hissediyor. Yani böyle resmen uşağın biri daha yeni lüt çalmayı öğrenmiş. Yeni lüt çalmayı öğrenmeye başlamış bir uşak gibi Hissediyor kendini diyoruz. Bunun dışında başka bir şey var mı düşünüp geliyorum. Okey kayıt başladı. Chapter 104. Dakit hey. After Felirin helped me discover what I was capable of, I took a more active hand in the creation of my shade. Felirin seemed pleased at my progress. But I was frustrated. There were no rules to follow, no facts to remember. Because of this, my quick wit and trooper's memory were of little use to me, and my progress seemed irritatingly slow. Eventually, I could touch my shade without fear of damaging it and change its shape according to my desire. With some practice, I could turn it from a short cape to a full hooded morning clock or anything in between. Still, it would be unfair for me to take even a hair of the credit for its creation. Henry was the one who gathered the shadow, wove it with moon and fire and daylight. My major contribution was the suggestion that It should have numerous little pockets. After we took the shade all the way into daylight, I thought our work was done, 
A suspicion seemed confirmed when we spent a long stretch of time swimming, singing, and otherwise enjoying each other's company. But Felirin avoided that topic of the shade whenever I brought it up. I didn't mind, as the revisions on the subject were always delightful. Because of this, I had the, I had the impression some part of it was left unfinished. One morning we awoke in an embrace, spent perhaps an hour kissing to arouse our appetites, then fell to our breakfast of fruit and fine white bread with honeycomb and olives. Then Felirin grew serious and asked me for a piece of iron. Her request surprised me. Some time ago I had thought to resume a few of my mundane habits. Using the surface of the pool as a mirror, I used my small razor to shave. At first, Fenrin had seemed pleased by my smooth cheeks and chin, but when I moved to kiss her, she pushed me to arm's length, snorting as if to clear her nose. She told me I reeked of iron and sent me into the forest, telling me not to return until I got the bitter sting of it from my face. So it was with no small amount of curiosity that I dug a piece of broken iron buckled out of my travel sack. I held it out to her nervously, the way you might hand a child a sharp knife. Why do you need it, I asked, trying to appear unconcerned. Felirin said nothing. She held it tightly between her thumb and two forefingers, as if it were a snake struggling to twist around and bite her. Her mouth made a thin line and her eyes began to brighten from their customary twilight purple to a deep water blue. Can I help? I asked. She laughed, not the light, chiming laugh I had heard so often, but a wild, fierce laugh. Do you want to help truly? She asked. The hand holding the shard of iron trembled slightly. I nodded, a little frightened, then go. Her eyes were still changing, brightening to a bluish white. I do not need flame now or songs or questions. And I didn't move, she made a show emotion. Go to the forest, do not wander far, but do not trouble me for the time it takes to love for times. Her voice had changed slightly too. Though still soft, it had taken on a brittle age that alarmed me. I was about to protest when she gave me a terrible look that sent me scampering mindlessly for the trees. I wandered aimlessly for a while, trying to gain, trying to regain my composure. This was difficult as I was baby naked and had being shooed away from the presence of serious magic that way, a mother sends a bothersome child away from the cook fire. Still, I knew I wouldn't be welcome back in the clearing for some time. So I pointed my face dayward and set off to explore. Dayward derken gündüze doğru diyanlıyam. I can't say why I wandered so far afield that day. Felirin had warned me to stay close, and I knew it to be good advice. Any of a hundred stories from my childhood told me the danger of wandering in the fair. Even discounting them, the stories Felirin herself had told should have been enough to keep me close to the safety of her twilight grove. My natural curiosity must take some of the blame, I suppose, but most of it belongs to my revised pride. Pride and folly, they go together like two tightly grasping hands. I walked for the better part of an hour as the sky above me slowly brightened into full daylight. I found a pad of source, but saw nothing living aside from the occasional butterfly or leaping squirrel. With every step I took, my mood teetered between boredom and anxiety. 
I was in the fay after all. I should be seeing marvelous things. Castles of glass, burning fountains, bloodthirsty throw, barefoot old man eager to give me advice. The trees gave way to a great grassy plain. All the parts of the fay Felirin had shown me had been forested, so this seemed a clear sign I was well outside the bounds of where I ought to be. Still I continued, enjoying the feel of sunlight on my skin after so long in the dim twilight of Felirin's glade. The trail I followed seemed to be leading to a long tree standing in the aggressive field. I decided I would go as far as the tree that had back. However, after walking for a long while, I didn't seem to be coming much closer to the tree. At first, I thought this was another oddity of the fay, but as I continued to make my stubborn way along the path, the truth became clear. The tree was simply larger than I had thought much larger and much farther away. The path did not ultimately lead to the tree. In fact, it curled away from it, avoiding it by more than half a mile. I was considering turning back when a bright flutter of color under the tree's canopy caught my eye. After a brief struggle, my curiosity won out and I stepped off the path into the long grass. It was no type of tree I had ever seen before, and I approached it slowly. It resembled a vast spreading willow with broader leaves of a darker green. The tree had deep hanging foliage scattered with pale powder blue blossoms. The wind shifted and as the leaves turned, I smelled a strange, sweet smell. It was like smoke and spice and leather and lemon. It was a compelling smell, not in the same way that food smells appealing. It didn't make my mouth water or my stomach grow. Despite this, if I'd seen something sitting on a table that smelled this way, even if it were a lump of stone or a piece of wood, I would have felt compelled to put it in my mouth, not out of hunger, but from sheer curiosity, much like a child might. As I stepped closer, I was struck with the beauty of the sea. The deep green of the leaves contrasted with the butterflies flitting from branch to branch, sipping from the pale blossoms of the tree. What I had taken at first to be a bed of flowers beneath the tree turned out to be a carpet of butterflies almost completely covering the ground. The scene was so breathtaking, I stopped several dozen feet away from the tree's canopy, not wanting to startle them into flight. Many of the butterflies flitting among the flowers were purple and black, or blue and black, like those in Felirian's clearing. Others were a solid, vibrant green, or gray and yellow, or silver and blue. But my eye was caught by a single large red one. Crimson shot through with a faint tracery of metallic gold. Its wings were bigger than my spread hand, and as, and as I watched it flutter deeper into the Foliage in search of a fresh flower to light upon. Okay, enteresan bir nokta. Bir sürü renkten bahsediyor ama sonra kırmızı bir tanesini izlemeye başlıyor. Kırmızı olanın kanatlarının genişlik kafasının ellerinden daha geniş falan. Yani sanki oradaki her bir renk birini temsil ediyormuş gibi kırmızı olan da kıvotu temsil ediyormuş gibi bir his geldi. Cepte doğrusu. Suddenly... Its wings were no longer moving in concert. They tumbled apart and fluttered separately to the ground like falling autumn leaves. Jesus Christ diyoruz. Tam kota benzettik ki kota benzetmemiz de gerekiyor bence. 
birden kanatları koptu, biri bir tarafa, diğeri bir tarafa düştü, direkt yok edildi diyor. Bir de o zaman niye after my eyes followed them to the base of the tree that I saw the truth. The ground below was not a resting place for butterflies. It was strewn, strewn with lifeless wings. Thousands of them littered the grass beneath the tree's canopy like a blanket of gemstones. The red ones offend my aesthetic claim the cool, dry voice from the tree. I took a step back, trying to peer through the thick canopy of hanging leaves. But manners chided the dry voice. The introduction stating, my apologies, sir, I said earnestly. Then remembering the tree's flowers, I amended, ma'am. But I have never spoken with a tree before and find myself at something of a loss. I dare say you are. I'm not tree. No more than is a man. A cheer. I am the cate. You are fortunate to find me. Many would envy you your chance. Chance, I echoed, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was speaking to me from among the branches of the tree. Birisi konuşuyor ama nereden konuştu belli değil. Bu din olur mu düşünce. A piece of an old story tickled my memory. Some scrap of folklore I'd read while searching for the chandri. You're an oracle, I said. Oracle, how quiet. Do not try to pee me with small names. I am cut hey. I am. I see. I know. Two iridescent blue black wings fluttered separately where there had been a butterfly before. At times I speak. I thought the red ones offended you. There are no red ones left. The voice was non -chilled. And the blue ones are ever so slightly sweet. I saw a flicker of movement. And another pair of sapphire wings began spinning slowly to the ground. The failures leave mainly, aren't you? I hesitated, but the dry voice continued. As if I danced with, I thought as much. I can smell the iron on you, just a hint. Still, one has to wonder how she stands it. A pause, a blur, a slight disturbance of a dozen leaves. Two more wings twitched, then fluttered downward. Come now, the voice continued, now coming from a different part of the tree. Though still hidden by the hanging leaves. Surely a curious boy is bound to have a question or two. Come ask. Your silence much offends me. I hesitated then said. I suppose I might have a question or two. Okay. Hiçbir şey sormasa bir sorun yok yani ortada. Ben böyle bir detayı hiç hatırladım hatırlamıyorum. Bir şahsi diyoruz. Ah, the sun was slow and satisfied. I thought you might. But can you tell me of the Amir? The kite sped an irritated noise. What is this? Why so guarded? Why the games? Ask me of the chandrin and have done. I stood stunned and silent. Surprised? Why should you be? Goodness, boy, you're like a clear pool. I can see ten feet through you, and you're barely three feet deep. There was another blur of motion, and two pairs of wings went spinning to the ground, one blue, one purple. I thought I saw a sinuous motion among the branches, but it was hidden by the endless wind-brushed swing of the tree. Okay, bir sinuslık çocuk görüyorsa böyle bir damar görüyor, bir et görüyor, bir insan mı var orada diyoruz. Ya da bir hayvan mi, bir şey mi var. Ama konuşabiliyorsa falan bir ağaç değil, insani bir şey var diyoruz. Okay. By the purple one I asked, simply to have something to say. Pure spite that like they said. I envied its innocence. It's lack of care. Besides, too much sweetness cloys me, as does willful ignorance. A pause. 
You wish to ask me of the chandri, do you not? I could do nothing but not. Not much to say, really, the Kote remarked flippantly. You would do better to call them the seventh law. Chandri has so much folklore hanging off it after all these years. The names used to be interchangeable, but nowadays, if you say Chandri, people think of ogres and rennings and skaven, such silliness. There was a long pause. I stood motionless until I realized the creature was waiting for a response. Tell me more, I said. My voice sounded, my voice sounded terribly thin to my own ears. Why I thought I detected a playful note in that voice? Because I need to know, I said, trying to force some strength back into my voice. Need? Kte asked skeptically. Why this sudden need? The masters at the university might know the answers you're looking for, but they wouldn't tell you even if you did ask which you want. You're too proud for that, too clever to ask for help, too mindful of your reputation. I tried to speak, but my throat did nothing but make a dry clicking sound. I swallowed and tried again, please, I need to know, they killed my parents. Are you going to try to kill that Chandrian? The voice sounded fascinated, almost taken aback. Try and kill them all yourself. My word, how will you manage it? Haliax has been alive 5,000 years. Fucking Christ. <laughs> 5,000 years and not one second's sleep. Clever to go looking for the Amir, I suppose. Even one prod is you can recognize the need for help. The order might give it to you. Trouble is, they're, hard, they're as hard to find as the seven themselves. Oh dear, oh dear. Whatever is a brave young boy to do, tell me I meant to shoot it, but it came out pleading. It would be frustrating, I suppose, that could take continued calmly. That if people who believe in the children are too afraid to talk, and everyone else will just laugh at you for asking. There was a dramatic side that seemed to come from several places in the foliage at once. That's a price you pay for civilization, duh. What price, I asked. Arrogance, the Kete said. You assume you know everything. You laughed at fairies until you saw one. Small wonder all your civilized neighbors dismissed the Chandrian as well. You'd have to leave your precious corners far behind before you found someone who might take you seriously. You wouldn't have a hope until you made it to the storm wall. There was a pause. Then another pair of purple wings went drifting to the ground. I swallowed against the dryness in my throat. Trying to think of what question I could ask to get more information. Not many folk will take your search for the Amir seriously, you realize, that like they continued calmly. The Amir, however, is quite an extraordinary man. He's already come close to them, though he doesn't realize it. Stick by the mayor and he will lead you to their door. Kim? Kim oğlum, biz bunu illa gördük. Bunun Stapes mi? Yoksa Braden mi? Ama Braden'ın sindir olduğunu biliyoruz gibi. Yoksa sindir mi Amir? Sindir bir şekilde ajan gibi bir şey mi? Puh, bilmiyorum, bilmiyorum. The Kute gave a thin dry chuckle. Blood, broken and bone. I wish you creatures had the wit to appreciate me. Whatever else you might forget, remember what I just said. Eventually you'll get the job. I guarantee you'll laugh when the time comes. What can you tell me about the Chandrin? I asked. Since you asked so sweetly, 
Cinder is the one you want, remember him, white hair, dark eyes, did things to your mother, you know, terrible. She held up well, though. Laurian was always a trooper, if you'll pardon the expression. Much better than your father, with all his begging and blubbering. My mind flashed pictures of things I had tried to forget for years. My mother, her hair wet with blood, her arms unnaturally twisted, broken at the wrist, the elbow. My father is barely cut open, and he left a trail of blood for 20 feet. He'd crawled to be closer to her. I tried to speak, but my mouth was dry. Why I managed to crop? Why? The they could, but a good question. I know so many whys. Why did they do such nasty things to your poor family? Why? Because they wanted to, and because they could, and because they had a reason. Why did they leave you alive? Why? Because they were sloppy, and because you were lucky, and because something scared them away. What scared them away, I thought numbly. But it was all too much, the memories, the things that voice said. My mouth worked silently, questioning. What the Kute asked? Are you looking for a different why? Are you wondering why I tell you these things? What good comes of it? Maybe this cinder did me a bad turn once. Maybe it amuses me to set a young pup like you snapping at his heels. Maybe the soft creaking of your tendons as you clench your fists is like a sweet symphony to me. Oh yes it is, and you can be sure. Why can't you find this cinder? Well, that's an interesting why. You think a man with cold black eyes would make an impression when he stops to buy a tree? Or can it be that you haven't managed to catch wind of him in all this time? I shook my head, trying to clear it of the smell of blood and burning hair. I could taste seemed to take it as a signal. That's right. I suppose you don't need me to tell you what he looks like. You just seen you seen him just a day or three ago. Realization thundered into me, the leader of the bandits, the graceful man in chain mail, Cinder. He was the one who had spoken to me when I was a child. The man with the terrible smile and the sword like winter eyes. Pity got away, the Kte continued. Still, you must admit you had quite a piece of luck. I'd say it was a twice in a lifetime opportunity meeting up with him again. Pity you wasted it. Don't feel bad you didn't recognize him. They have a lot of experience hiding those telltale signs. Not your fault at all. It's been a long time, years. Besides, you've been busy carrying favor, rolling around in the cushions with some pixie, sating your base desires. Three green butterflies twitched all at once. Their wings looked like leaves as they spun to the ground. Speaking of desires, what would your Dana think? My, my, imaginary seeing you here. You and the pixie all tangled up, at it like rabbits. He beats her, you know, her patron, not all the time, but often. Sometimes in a temper, but mostly it's a game to him. How far can he go before she cries? How far can, how far can he push before she tries to leave and he has to lure her back again? It's nothing grotesque, mind you. Not burns, nothing that will leave a scar. Not yet. Two days ago, he used his walking stick. That was new. Vast the size of your thumb under her claws. Revises down to the bone. She's trembling on the floor with blood in her mouth. And you know what she thinks before the black? You. She thinks of you. You thought of her too, I'm guessing, in between the swimming and strawberries and the rest. The Kate made a sound like a sigh. Poor girl, she's tied to him so tight. Things that 
thinks that's all she is good for. Wouldn't leave him even if you asked, which you want. You so careful, so scared of starting her way. And well, you should be too. She's a runner, that one. Now that she's left separate, how can you hope to find her? It's a shame you left without a word, you know. She was just beginning to trust you before that. Before you got angry, before you ran off. Just like every other man in her life. Oh, o kadar iyi ki lan hani. Bütün kitap resmen şu bölümün şu şiddeti için hazırlanmış gibi. Yani resmen bıçaklıyor böyle. Kvot kalbine ve biz onu hissedebiliyoruz o yediği bıçakları. Diyecek hiçbir şey yok. Just like every other man. Lasting after her full of sweet birds. Then just walking away. Leaving her alone. Good thing she's used to it by now, isn't it? Otherwise you might have hurt her. Otherwise, you just might have broken that poor girl's heart. It was all too much. I turned and ran, patting madly back the way I had come. Back to the quiet twilight of Federian's clearing, away, away, away. And as I ran, I could hear Kate speaking behind me. His dry, quiet voice followed me longer than I would have thought possible. Come back, come back. I more to say. I so much more to tell you. Won't you stay? Yani bunu demesi belki en azından bir işaret neye dair? Daha söyleyecek şeyleri vardı ama söyleyemedi. Bu niye önemli olacak? Yere gelince konuşuyoruz. Okay, otherwise you just might have broken that poor girl's heart diyor on kelime. Ondan sonra quote, it was all too much artık katlanamıyor, kaçıp gidiyor. Coincidence diyoruz. Doesn't think so. It was hours before I came back to Felirian's clearing. I'm not sure how I found my way. I only remember being surprised at the sight of her. Pavilion through the trees. The side of it slowed the mad spinning of my toes until I could begin to think again. I went to the pool and took a long, deep drink, splashing water on my face to clear my head and hide the signs of tears. After a moment or two of quiet reflection, I stood and walked to the pavilion. It was only then that I noticed a curious lack of butterflies. There were usually at least a handful flitting around, but now there were not. Şimdi aklıma geldi, hemen onu söyleyeyim. Bu kıte için işte bilgi ağacını temsil ettiği söyleniyor. Bu Adem'le Havva'nın kendisinden meyve yediği. O ağacın içinde de bir yılan vardı. Yılan diyordu ki bunları işte bu meyveden yerseniz siz de Allah gibi olacaksınız, her şeyi anlayacaksınız. Cırt bunlar yiyorlardı. Sonra birden çıplaklıklarını fark ediyorlardı. Kvot'ta ne oldu? Kvot kıtaya gitmeden önce çıplaklığının farkındaydı ama sonra yine de yürümeye devam etti. Ağaçtan bir ses geliyor. Ağacın, ağaç knowledge ağacı gibi bir şey zaten. Knowledge meyvesi diyorduk. Ağaçta kvota Kvot'un kendisine hiç kimsenin söyleyemeyeceğini düşündüğü bildiği şeyleri söyleyebildi ağaç ve gelecekten konuştu. Kvot'a bilgi öğrendi. Sonra çıplaklığının farkına vardı. Nasıl vardı? Bir şekilde Felirün'le yaşadığı şey yanlıştı. Çünkü Dena, gerçek aşkı Kvot'un Dena'nın peşinden gitmesi lazımdı. Dena'yla arasının iyi olması için uğraşması lazımdı. Ama bütün bunların hiçbirini yapmadan sağa sola saptı, saptı. Bu mu hani böyle kendi çıplaklığının farkına varması? Not sure. Okay. Felirin was there, but the side of her only unsettled me further. It was the only time I had ever seen her look less than perfectly beautiful. She lay among the cushions, drawn and weary, as if I had been gone for days instead of hours. And she had not eaten or slept all the while. 
She lifted her head tiredly when she heard me approach. It is done, she said, but when she looked at me, her eyes widened with surprise. I looked down and saw that I was bramble-torn and bloody. I was spattered with mud and grass, stained along my entire left side. I must have fallen during my mindless flight away from the Ktay. Felirun sat upright. What has come of you? I brushed absently at a bit of dried blood on my elbow. I might ask the same of you. My voice sounded thick and coarse, as if I had been shooting. When I looked up, I saw real concern in her eyes. I went walking David. I found something in a tree. It called itself a kate. A kate değil kanka, da kate diyoruz. Ama senin ağzından çıkan şey dedim direkt doğru olma ihtimali var. Ve sen a kate diyorsan birden fazla kate olma ihtimali de var. Olabilir. Federer went motionless when I spoke its name. Da kate, did you speak? I know that. Did you ask of it? But before I could answer, she gave a quiet, despairing cry and rushed to me. She began to run her hands over my body, as if searching for wounds. After a minute of this, she took my face in her hands and looked into my eyes, as if frightened of what she might find there. Are you well? Her concern brought a faint smile to my lips. I began to assure her that I was fine. Then I remembered the things that Kate had said. I remembered the fires and the men with ink black eyes. I thought of Dennis sprawled on the floor with a mouthful of blood. Tears came to my eyes and I choked. I turned away and shook my head, eyes clenched shut and unable to speak. She stroked the back of my neck and said, All is well, the hurt will go. It has not bit you, and your eyes are clear, so all is well. It has not bit you falan diyor, demek ki yılan diyoruz. Hani bir şekilde o kelebeklere nasıl saldırdı, yaprakları hareketsiz kalıyordu, sonra kelebeklerden biri ölmüş oluyordu. It has bit you falan, yılan diyoruz. Başka ben başka bir ihtimal görmüyorum. I pulled away from her enough to look her in the face. My eyes, the things that could taste says, can leave men broken in their heads. But I would see if it were so. You're still my quote, still my sweet poet. She leaned forward, oddly hesitant, and gave me a gentle kiss on my forehead. It lies to men and tries them mad. She shook her head slowly. The kate does not lie. It has the gift of seeing, but it only tells things to hurt men. Only a dinnerling would speak to the kate. She touched the side of my neck to soften her words. I know that, know it to be the truth. And I began to cry. Chapter 105 Interlude A Certain Sweetness Kapatmadan önce diyecek bir şey var mı düşünüp geliyorum. Nope, hadi görüşürüz.